The Grind is sponsored by The74Million.org. The74 is an award-winning nonprofit education news website which believes that education should be front page news every day. So I'm actually here with editorial director Steve Snyder. Hi, Steve. Hey, Mark. So the grind is really focused on what happens after college when you enter the working world. But you guys are actually doing new work about what happens after high school, right? There is this new movement among some of uh, America's top schools, highest performing schools, to do a better job of tracking how they're serving kids that may be coming into their school systems in sixth grade or in ninth grade for high school and tracking what happens to them as alumni as they push their way through college. And it's kind of this new wave of, of you know, not seeing high school graduation as the end, but as part of a continuum that what we're trying to do is get getting kids from early education, even pre-K, all the way through to their first job. And so we've launched a special website dedicated to this called The Alumni, and it's tracking all these efforts of these really unique schools that are saying, you're our ninth grader, we hold ourselves accountable to getting you a college degree within six years of graduating high school. And we're, we're going to own that. And we're not just going to talk about graduation rates. We're going to talk about college completion rates. So where can we find these stories, Steve? So you can see all of our alumni coverage at the 74 millionorg Hey, Mark. What up, Yusuf? Can you hear me, man? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. This is Yusuf. I've been working with him for over a year. He was born in the States, but he lived in Algeria for most of his childhood. He moved back to Washington State in high school, and he lives with his family of six in a two-room apartment in Federal Way. Hey, I wish I could say the same, man. I'm grinding so hard. I know, man. Man, it feels... Hey, when I go to sleep, it feels so good, though. And look, he's an amazing kid. Multiple scholarships, dean's list in computer science, president of the Muslim Student Association, the list goes on. Last year, he applied for a ton of internships through his college website, and he basically struck out across the board, which isn't crazy, given he was just a sophomore. But this year, we have the full court press on. We worked on his resume, his cover letter. I introduced him to folks in my network, and it looks like it's starting to pay off. Yusuf, what's up, man? Hey, I killed it, man. Are you, you killed it? I killed it. I killed, hey, the first one, Liberty Mutual, I killed it so good. She was like, you need to interview with some managers, with two managers. I was like, one is not enough, I need two. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. But those were all first round interviews. Despite getting his foot in the door at amazing companies like Google, Starbucks, and Liberty Mutual, he hasn't landed a gig yet. Welcome to The Grind. I'm your host, Mark Casali. My name is Warren Lankford. And Mark, I wanted to ask you, so what exactly is going on here with Yusef? Okay, uh, this might sound a little crazy, Warren, uh, but I think you might be being a little too honest in these interviews. How can you be too honest? Um, Okay, uh, let me play a clip for you uh, from a conversation we had before his last couple interviews. What are my weaknesses? I feel like technology, applying technology, like my tech skills, applying them to that specific company. That's one of my weaknesses. So I always try to be real with them, like for the Liberty Mutual. I was honest with the lady. She asked me about data database uh, question. She was like, oh, have you worked in database? I was like, I did work in it, but then I'm not really proficient in it. I still have some room for improvement. And she was impressed about how I answered the question because I made it personal. I told her I'm not, I don't have, I don't feel like I'm ready for it, but then I learned. See, those weaknesses that he talks about in that interview, they make me a little nervous. What do you mean? Isn't it good that he's being honest and transparent? I mean, are you saying he should lie? Okay, no, no. If you learn one thing from this podcast, do not lie in an interview. But look, I think it's normal to want to accentuate your positives and minimize some of your weaknesses in an interview. I mean, that's advice I've given him. Listen. The other thing I tell people is... Think of yourself as a product, okay? You're selling Yusuf. And when you sell a product, you don't pick 20 characteristics of that product. You pick three, right? So what are the three things about you that are better than anyone else who's applying for this job? I'm writing that down. But your questions are also chances for you to demonstrate something about yourself, right? I don't know, Mark. Is that really good advice? You're a product? 
I mean, I mean, I just don't love the way that sounds. Like you're using your questions as a way to highlight positive traits, but shouldn't you just, you know, be you? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you is awesome, then yes, you should be you. But look, if I was myself in my first couple interviews, if I was like 100% honest about my weaknesses and I said like, yeah, um, I get kind of moody sometimes and I lack attention to detail and I'm sort of impatient and sometimes I like kind of blow up at people randomly, like that would have probably been a bad look for me, Warren, in some of my first interviews. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you don't want to come right out and say you're a hothead in your first interview. Or I could just be less of an asshole. Whoa, calm down, Mark. Whoa, don't. You're seeing the hothead in me. <laughs> this is the hothead. <laughs> All right, so I guess let's let's try to answer the question in today's episode. Is it better to be super impressive or is it better to just be yourself? Okay, let's see what YouTube says here. I googled interview tips, and this is one of the first videos that came up. It's from uh, it's from a company called Alpha M. Okay, and uh, what does Alpha M stand for? Alpha male. Oh, okay. So then, to be clear, if I was you know, 19 years old or 20 years old and applying for my first job and I Googled like interview tips, I would get this video by an alpha male. So today, gentlemen, we're going over 10 tips to crush an interview. Please note, I am not going to justify be on time with a tip. If you're that much of a moron to be late, you don't deserve the job in the first place. It's a little condescending. Get more into it. Dive into Google. Dive into their website. Figure out this company so that when you go in, you're ready to talk shop. In most interviews, the interviewer is going to ask you at some point, hey, what questions do you have for me? And if you're like, none. All right. <laughs> it means that you really haven't thought about things. This is your opportunity to shine. This is not an opportunity to be super modest, but you have to be delicate in the sense that you don't want to look like you're. First of all, this guy's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's definitely an imperfect messenger. But look, I got to be honest, some of the stuff he's talking about, I, I sort of think it's actually good advice. Okay. So, like doing your research, doing your homework, thinking about your audience in an interview, that's good advice. And look, if you're. Trying to make the decision between being really confident in the interview and being kind of introspective and navel gazy, like I think you should be confident. Being confident is good. I actually know somebody who is really good at selling herself in interviews and she does it in like an authentic and really likable way. Oh, who's that? My name is Lindsay. I'm Mark's sister, younger sister. Do you think you're good at getting jobs? I do. Why? I feel like this is going to make me sound like a sociopath, but just <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, there's something really powerful to coming into an interpersonal situation like an interview and being able to get a sense of what someone wants you to say. And like the kinds of things you might need to say to succeed, to win. And I like talking to people. I actually like interviewing for the most part. And I wouldn't say it's always so superficial as that, but you get to a point in the interview, and, and i sorry, I keep saying you, I should be saying me. I get to a point in an interview where I kind of even lose track of if I want the job or not. Um, because I'm like, I want them to like me. I want to win it. <laughs> I want to win the job. Okay, well, as we're as we're going through this, I'm realizing that like the biggest issue with actually being too good at interviewing is that you might actually get the job. Yeah, to you for. might get the job, and then you're stuck with it. And now that I think about it, she has had a lot of jobs. My first job in New York was at an art uh, gallery. After that, I moved on to Prospect Park Alliance. After Prospect Park, I worked at the Madison Square. Then I worked at the Tokyo Art Gallery. Okay, so how many total jobs is that? I have to count now. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> I think it's been six. Does that feel like a lot of jobs? It does feel like a lot of jobs to me. In seeking to win an interview or to win a job, 
maybe I have in the past have not looked critically enough at what the job actually looked like and what the culture of the organization looked like in just wanting to answer the questions I was given correctly. I wasn't really asking, giving my space, myself space to like ask the questions that I needed to ask to analyze whether the job was actually right for me. When that moment of, do you have any questions for us came up, I had a few kind of go-to questions that I'd ask, like, how did you get into this role? And that can be a very helpful thing to know, but that didn't answer questions for me about what's your culture of collaboration or what's, what's my, where, where's my room to grow? So I think what's happening is that she's so focused on getting the job that she's not asking herself if she really wants it. And then she wakes up six months later and she's in the job and she has to leave. Yeah, and it's not always pretty. Actually, for me, a lot of times it has physical manifestations. I got serious rosacea when I was in my consulting job. And the minute I left, it went away. That's crazy. (laughs) Oh, that does not sound good. No, no. Okay, uh, I'm getting a little confused now. I think we need to talk to an expert. My name is Vincent Feliciano. I live in uh, New York City. Uh, I currently work for Tribune Media as a director of labor and employment relations, though I am required by my uh, my boss to uh, make the caveat that I uh, the thoughts I'm sharing here are my own and not those of Tribune Media. We're going to cut that out anyways, Vinny, so (laughs) don't worry about it. Vinny's in labor relations and he's conducted a number of interviews, so he thinks about these questions a lot. And there's one more thing. If I understood your email correctly, it sounds like you have a hundred percent success rate getting jobs from interviews. Is that right? If if I manage to land an in-person interview, then yes. So I, you know, I'm fudging. I think I'm fudging the stats there a little bit. But whenever I've managed to get through the screening elements of the application process, the application, you know, the phone screen, the resume check, uh, if I can get in the room, I have a hundred percent success rate with job offers. That's impressive. And are we talking about like like three for three, or more like fifteen for fifteen, or something? It's probably, I think it was, uh, is either 10 or 11 or 12. I, I kind of don't have the exact number. That's but. pretty impressive. That's like a streak. I mean, that's, that, that you, you have like, uh, you're like a pitcher going into the eighth inning of a no hitter here. Like, I feel like just talking about this means the next time you interview at a place, you're going to bomb it. Yeah, you, you know, like the first thing of no hitters is no one talks about it on the bench, right? And like, now we're you, talking about it in a podcast. <laughs> And Vinny believes pretty strongly that you need to be yourself in an interview. So the the, the big thing for me is somebody who's sincere, uh, and and that they acknowledge and recognize just as I do that this process is about ter- determining whether a fit exists. It's not about manipulating each other so that you know you can. As an applicant, I don't want to see someone just trying to get the job at all costs. It's possible that. You may be really qualified, but it's not a good fit. I want to know that we're going to be able to get along and do work together. I mean, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say most people probably spend more time with their coworkers and you know at their job than they do with their family. So I absolutely want to know that we're going to be able to get along, have conversations about these things, that there's some kind of of, of a fit with that you know that you'll you'll be able to gel well with the team with with the organization. Yeah. So I mean, Vinny used this word fit a couple times now, and in shorthand, I mean, I've used it all the time in hiring processes at my last firm. Um, but I've done some reading, and it can. There's another interpretation of the word "fit," which kind of is a way of biasing an interview process to say, "Look, you, you know, you're not the type of person that belongs here." And maybe that's even on the lines of, you know, gender, you know, race, income. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a tough one. Just simply knowing that the bias exists doesn't make it any easier to overcome. Um, so you you do have to be aware of it, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to fall subject to it. Mm. I think that's why you have, an, in part at least, why you have a number of people who, who interview in single applicants. It's more about, will you be able to jump in and kind of get right into the workflow that our team has established? Um, you know, do I, do I have to spend time 
you know, teaching someone how to work independently, how to handle some of these more complex issues that we're dealing with in our field, or will I be able to say, hey, you know, we received a request for arbitration. I'd like you to follow up, you know, pick an arbitrator and get that set up and on the calendar and have someone kind of know what that means. Um, so that's that's me kind of with that's what I'm talking about when I say fit. And for me, naturally, what that tends to do is when the work flows really well, there's a for me a closer sense of kind of camaraderie with with the people that I work with when we get along because there's no there's no tension or friction over right. trying to get work done. Um, right. So it's think- stemming from the work for you. It's not like a social thing. It's you know we're happy. We're getting along. We're in the groove. When you know on, from a work perspective, w- you know we're fitting and we're gelling. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are, there are lots of people who I would not, I wouldn't say who I work with, who I probably wouldn't spend time without like after work, I wouldn't really go, you know, go, go to their house for dinner. But you know, as far as during the work day, I'm happy to go and grab a sandwich and sit down and chat because you know, as, as far as getting things done, that's the number one focus for me at work. And so that's how I, that's how I get along best with people is when we're able to get these things done. And Vinny also brings up a practical point. It's actually hard to embellish in an interview. And I'm not a great salesman. That's part of why I have to be myself. <laughs> it's because I'm, I've never been that person that can walk into a room and, and make everybody like me. Um, you know, so I, I tend to have to rely on being, you know, being very sincere about who I am, being very sincere about my own deficiencies. And it can actually be a positive to be honest about your weaknesses. If you can discuss yourself critically, then it means you're, you're willing to discuss that with other people who have some, some something critical to share about you. Uh, and if that's going to happen throughout your career. Career. And if you're not willing to, to, to do that and, and you can't show your potential employer that you're willing to have that conversation and continue to work hard through it, that's a bit of a red flag. For me, self-knowledge is one of the big traits I look for in people I work with because we're going to fail together an awful lot, right? I mean, it's we're not going to succeed right away. And, and as a new employee, honestly, I wouldn't expect you to you know, come in even, even if you're a good fit, you know, Vinny. I think the, the goal would be, yeah, come in, be productive as soon as possible, but I don't expect people to to be productive right away. I, I'm almost expecting I'm going to sink, you know, two months into getting you up to speed. If you are the kind of person who knows you're not up to speed and it's kind of working to make sure you're there or is very acutely aware of sort of your deficiencies and where you need to improve, I can work with that. You know, people who are kind of blind to that, uh, that's the, really the danger. So I think self-knowledge, such an important skill in the job market. And if you can portray that and convey that in your interview by being more honest and upfront, that's only going to work in your favor. That that's a really really good point. Because at the end of the day, the interview is just the beginning. If, if everything goes well, you know, the, the interview is not going to be something that you, you're spending a lot of time thinking about or talking about. It's going to be something that is just a footnote in what is otherwise a, a long and happy career. It's a story that you'll end up telling you know, your friends and colleagues when you're out for lunch or out for a drink after work about the first time that you met you know, Mike and Tim and John and Sarah and Kelly and, and you know, what that was like, what first impressions were like. So you don't you want to think longer term when you're when you're at that point. So it definitely sounds like Vinny is coming down on the side of be yourself. Yeah, no, he is. Um, but that's not to say that he doesn't have some really practical tips on how you should look good in interviews. Yeah, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't share a few of those tips we gleaned from our own interviews and research. Even from Alpha M. Yes, Mark, even from Alpha M. <laughs> okay. Interview tips. All right, so tip one, research the company and the job. Yeah, and do your homework. So, yeah, you should look through the company website, look at newspaper articles, but, like, the ultimate is if you can find somebody who actually works at that company and ideally works in the same group or even has done the same job you're interviewing for, get to them and actually ask them some real questions about the role you're interviewing for. Okay, next tip, stories. In the business, we call this showing, not telling. And there's a few reasons why this is important, especially in journalism, which is where I come from. Getting more into your life journey will show not only that you have good communication skills, that you're interested in the job enough to share this sort of thing. So I had a question for you. Um, I've been listening to a bunch of like NPR news, and I feel like a lot of times it's radio. They could just tell you, hey, this happened. 
but instead they actually send people to the site and they record audio and interviews from that place. Like, why is it important to actually get the story firsthand rather than just saying today this and this and this happened? I think it's an authenticity thing, right? I think we think of news as getting stale and fresh. And where is it freshest? Where it happened. Yeah, and I think when you tell someone a story, it's easier for them to connect and understand as opposed to just saying, you know, today in Olympia, this law was passed. Exactly. And, and so the same applies to your interview, basically. If I tell you, um, you know, I'm a really hard worker, okay. But if I tell you a story about that time that I stayed up all night to finish the assignment, it makes it much more real. And if you're looking for like a handy way to remember stories and to communicate them quickly, we call this the STAR method. So it's the situation, the task, the activity, and the result. That's just like a really simple way to tie up a story. All right, so next tip, be prepared to talk about everything on your resume. It is all fair game. Okay, I have a funny and embarrassing story about this. Um, I was a Russian miner in college. Um, really? Yeah. More on that in future episodes. Yeah. Um, but for a while, I had it just sitting on the bottom of my resume because, you know, like I got the minor, might as well put it on my resume. So I go into an interview that was entirely unrelated to Russian, and the interviewer starts, you know, riffing to me in Russian. And I'm like blank stare, cold sweat, and I have to just be like, uh, yet, uh, pajolsta, uh, you know, and so... If, if you're not prepared to talk about it, don't put it on your resume. I quickly deleted the Russian miner from the resume. Did you get that job? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Next, in advance, you need to put yourself in your interviewer's shoes and think through the questions they are most likely to ask and be ready for those. Yeah, and I think the most important question for you to think about is why. Um, why you, and then why do you actually want the job? So you actually should practice your responses. Yeah, I, I think so. It, it's tough because you don't want to sound canned and like you can really tell in an interview when someone is like reciting a memorized script that they've practiced. But if you're a preparer and you prepare for things in your life and that's how you feel comfortable, then yeah, you should prepare. I mean, I did like 50 practice case interviews when I was trying to break into consulting um, and it wasn't so I could be scripted. It was just that made me feel comfortable. Um, so if you're the type of person who studies really hard for tests and that makes you feel prepared, then you should prepare. If you're like more the type of person who rolls out of bed and glances at the notes and wings it and always gets a B plus on your test, then yeah, you don't need to prepare as much. <laughs> okay, let's get forward. A couple days before, get ready, plan your route. If it's a virtual interview, make sure Skype is working and that you're in a quiet space. Have a fresh notebook, print your resume, and make sure you have clean clothes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's a joke, but it's actually super important. Um, and it's totally okay for the record to ask the recruiter what you should wear. Um, I know I have felt consternation and worry going into interviews, just thinking like, am I dressed appropriately? So ask the recruiter. That's totally fair game. Cool. All right, so finally, after the interview, uh, follow up. Okay, this is a thank you note, an email, um, and ideally you're including something from the interviewer that stuck with you. I know it seems a little cheesy, but it's a nice little touch and it can go a long way. All right, I feel good about this, but Mark, we haven't really answered our question yet. Yeah, okay, so the question, should you be yourself or should you try to impress at all costs in an interview? All right, so I've kind of done a 180 on this. I think I started out thinking, look, it's an interview. You got to show out. You got to impress. Um, but after listening to Vinny, you know, I do think it's probably the right idea to be yourself. I come out on that side, too. I just don't really think uh, that, you know, in the long run, it's going to do anyone any favors if you're being this abstract weirdo more impressive version of yourself i think we should be real about the fact that this is hard though like when you're trying to get your first job when you're trying to break in to just lay all your weaknesses bare to be totally real about yourself it's asking a lot mm -hmm. and that's a high pressure situation who's going to be themselves you yeah, gotta be it's the most not a normal situation in the world. <laughs> <laughs> if you are entirely at home interviewing, that says something about who you are, right? Like, if, right. if that's your happy place. Well, it, maybe Lindsay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that it's her happy place. <laughs> I guess the big thing is eventually the interview ends and the job starts. And it might be okay to be someone, a heightened, more impressive version of yourself for an hour long interview, but it's going to really grate on you to try to do that for a month six months a year you know so in the long run gonna be a better approach to be yourself 
All right, should we hear from Yusuf to close off the episode? Yeah, what's up with Yusuf? So what happens if you don't get this Liberty Mutual or Starbucks? It's whatever, you know, got to look a different route. You know, there's no, I'm not trying to lose hope, but then if you don't, you don't. Like, look for another door. I'm getting there. It's just a matter of when. That's the hard part is when, because I don't want to be wasting time. Just doing stuff that are not going to add value to my life and wasting time. So I'll get there, but a matter of when. That's all I can tell you. Did that answer the question or more? No, it's good, man. Yeah. All right, that's all for today, everybody. As always, we want to thank Trackman Productions and PG Boo for our music. Hey, why not? Let's thank the Washington State Opportunity Scholarship as well. We're off next week for Thanksgiving. Hope you enjoy that with your family, and we'll be back talking about job interviews again in two weeks. Thanks, everybody.